Good morning. Good morning to anyone joining us today. We will be starting in just a minute or so. So thank you for your patience. We're just waiting for more folks to join us and we will be with you shortly. Thank you for joining us today. Okay, let's get started. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening to anyone joining us today. My name is Alan Dominguez, and on behalf of the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative, I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar, IDDSI Town Hall, where we're gonna spend the next hour answering your questions live. Now, joining us today on this call are Katrina Steele, Jan Dubestein, and Peter Lamb, IDDSI board members and experts in the IDDSI framework testing and implementation. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to thank you, the listeners, for being here and for spending this time with us. And I would also like to thank our very generous sponsors who allow the work of IDDSI to continue and global implementation to happen. Some housekeeping before we begin. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our website at the end of the month. Um, and there will be a certificate of attendance emailed to anyone attending via a computer. So if you are joining us on the phone, please make sure to email us at meetings at iddsi.org with your name uh, so that we can issue you a certificate of attendance. Now for this town hall, uh, we need your questions. So, and you can submit your questions uh, three ways basically. Uh, one, using the chat function, uh, in the Zoom platform. You can raise your little hand over there. You'll see a, an option that says raise hand. Once we see that, we will activate your microphone so you can submit your questions um, and the panelists will answer them. Now, if you feel shy and you don't want us to hear your voice, you can still submit a question via the chat function or the Q&A button on the middle of your menu bar at the bottom or at the top of your screen. Uh, so if you are not uh, answer, uh, raising your hand and, and you're not the one talking at the moment. Uh, you don't have to worry. <laughs> your microphone will remain off for the, for the session. Uh, so you can just sit back and relax. But we highly encourage everyone to, to participate with us and to answer all those burning questions. Um, so I think that's all I have for now. So without further ado, I am going to uh, hand it over to Peter Lamb, co-chair of the IDDSI uh, Board of Directors. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this town hall. We really appreciate everybody making the time to uh, join us today. Um, to start the town hall, I think um, one of the first things we wanted to do uh, was really just to bring us back all onto the same page. And that is, why are we doing ITSI? Um, and we've had a lot of communications from the global audience. Um, many are uh, telling us they love ITSI. There's some people who say to us, oh my goodness, why did you bring this upon us? Um, and again, we uh, go back to the essence of the initiative which is safety through common terminology for all ages, all care settings, all cultures. And for some of you on this call, you've probably heard this a few times before uh, during conferences and during webinars. Um, and we just wanted to remind people that ITSI is a framework that was published in November of 2015. Uh, we have information available on the website, uh, www.itsi.org, um, that this global standardized framework really provides uh, standardization of terminology definitions for texture modified foods and thickened liquids, 
Um, and for anyone new to uh, ITSI joining us today, um, we just wanted to remind you that um, ITSI was developed to try to ensure safety when communication about texture modification of foods and thickening of liquids by using a continuum of eight levels, as you see in the framework to the bottom right of your screen there. It is a color-coded model. The colors uh, have, in fact, been uh, challenged uh, with uh, color blindness challenge tests, uh, 26 of them, in fact, so that those with the most severe uh, color blindness challenges can still distinguish one level from another. Um, the terms used are culturally neutral and uh, so that they can easily be translated. And uh, as some of you know, uh, there are many uh, translations un underway at the moment. There have been some that have been finalized. Um, and that the framework also comes with uh, detailed descriptors, testing methods, uh, and evidence, the best evidence that we can find at this point to support uh, both the use of drink thickness as well as food texture levels. So when it comes to the ITSI framework, I think one of the things that we really do want to remind the audience uh, and, and the worldwide audience and, and, and people who have been embracing this um, and are in the midst of adopting ITSI, that <clears throat> it is a standardization of terminology, description, and testing methods, and that ITSI is not a prescription. And we reiterate that it's not a diet prescription. Um, there have been many questions that have come in to uh, us that have asked, oh, can I use this level for so-and-so with this condition? I think we really want to reiterate to everyone that ITSI is a framework to um, allow us to be able to communicate consistently about food texture, the property of the food, the behavior, liquid thickness, the property of the thickened liquids, the behavior, so that we can all understand each other when we say that a soft and bite-sized level six food um, may be most appropriate for this person once we have had the uh, assessment and evaluation and recognize what their um, eating and drinking skills look like. And so I think we just wanna be mindful of the fact and, and remind everybody um, that we really shouldn't be saying, oh, uh, Mrs. Jones is a level six. Uh, rather, Mrs. Jones uh, actually has the skills uh, and ability to manage the foods that are described in level six. And so we hope that that puts some context into the use of the ITSI framework. Um, and so, um, that's how I think we'd like to launch uh, the town hall today. And we are certainly now open to take any of your questions. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Katrina and Jan uh, to please feel free to chime in to the comment that was just made. Um, and so here we go. Peter, this is Katrina. Maybe I'll just jump in and, and um jump on what you've said, because I think the majority of the questions that we get are uh, framed in, in the manner where somebody says, is this food allowed on level X, whichever level it is. And I think what we want to communicate is that it's very difficult to answer that question because foods and liquids for that matter um, may vary. And so bread is a good example. The bread in one place might be crisper or softer. Um, and so the, the default answer to that question is use the testing methods that we've made available to decide whether that item 
where it fits in the framework. Um, so there's a question online about um, uh, oatmeal, I think, um, that I've seen. That's right. So hot cereals like oatmeal, cream of wheat, etc. cetera. Um, and the comment here, which is absolutely accurate, is that the consistency of a hot cereal might change over time. There are all sorts of other things where the consistency will change over time. Um, soup, for example, might thicken as it cools down. Um, and so the, the uh, power of the ITSI testing methods is that it allows you to evaluate the food item uh, at the point where it's going to be served and to understand what its properties are. Um, and then to use your clinical decision-making skills to decide whether that item is or isn't appropriate for your patient. Um, and so rather than saying these items are allowed on level X, we would like to reframe that as the characteristics of this food at this point um, uh, suggest that it falls into level X. Um, and so I hope that's helpful to reframe it. Um, and it also allows for some um, variations. Of, um, so let's just say, um, for example, that um, I'm trying to come up with a good example, um, but let's say one facility has a cake available that um, is soft and moist and, uh, and actually when it's tested, it's compliant with level six characteristics, um, but another facility might have a, a, a cake that doesn't meet those requirements. And so um, the mapping of where that item, those items fall would be different. You can't say generically that because it's cake, it's going to fall here or there. Great. Uh, thanks, Katrina. Uh, so I think we have a variety of questions that have been submitted already. Um, you pointed the first one out. So I'm just going to go through this list, if that's okay with everyone, and uh, we can answer them as we go. So Melanie is asking, uh, the minced and moist audit sheets state equal or less than two millimeters wide and eight millimeters in length. Is that accurate for pediatrics? Uh, Jan B, go ahead, please. Yeah. Hi, Melanie. Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, yes, that is Jen, um, there? What, what we have put out for the... Um, Hi, uh, Jen. I, I don't think we can hear you. I can hear her, Alan. Yeah, Alan, <laughs> we can hear Jen. Oh, oh okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Okay, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Watching the little green thing go up and down, so I'm hoping that I can be heard. Um, so basically, um, this, this was based on, you'll recall that the adult size is the four millimeter and um, the eight millimeter length, that actually gets back on how you actually chew and process. So what we're saying in there is that two, there's sort of three dimensions to the food. So two of the dimensions should be the two millimeters but that they can be as long as the eight millimeter in length. And you'll recall that eight millimeters is about the um, size that we recommend for, for the level um, six soft and bite size for the pediatric version. So because we don't chew food into absolute little tiny, you know, very proper sized pieces, it tends to be a mix of that. So this is very much if you're thinking about um, the the level or the sizing you'd use this for. This is for, would be used for a child who has um, potentially, you know, some ability to break down a little bit or to encourage a little bit of that chewing. So that very sort of early type of chewing. Um, if you were very concerned about any type of a lump in that, um, for that child, you may be wanting to assess it more at a pureed level. So that's what the um, dimensional um, uh, in a recommendation is based on it's based on what we understand and know about chewing for pediatrics. Thanks, Jan. Thanks for uh, answering that question. <clears throat> there was uh, a question that came in earlier than that. Uh, just wanted to acknowledge Erica asks, uh, will we receive the slide deck for today? Uh, the answer is no, because what you saw was the slide deck. The uh, intention of today's uh, town hall really is to answer questions. So um, their information that we have just shared with you at the introduction 
can all be found uh, on the ITSI website. So we welcome you uh, to please go to the website to look for more information. Um, the next question um, also from Melanie was, what is the role of dietitian with ITSI and flow testing? Is it within their scope of practice to be able to flow test and make recommendations? Um, Katrina, we'll hand it over to you. Sure, as a non dietitian I'll attempt an answer here. Um, so the first thing I wanna say is that uh, ITSI is intended to be a global framework um, and it's not really related to scope of practice for any one particular profession. Um, and in, in, with respect to the first part of your question, Melanie, anybody can run a flow test or a fork pressure test or any of the IDSI tests and identify the characteristics of a food or liquid. That's, that's not bounded by anybody's scope of practice. Um, and indeed, uh, you know, we hope that family members will run these tests if they are concerned and, and that sort of thing. Um, with respect to making recommendations about what kinds of consistencies are appropriate for a, a particular patient, that would fall into a scope of practice domain, and that will vary across jurisdictions in terms of which professions are recognized to have the um, skills and competencies necessary to do swallowing and feeding assessments and make recommendations um, to our knowledge, there are very few jurisdictions around the world where that is a, a regulated, limited um, scope of practice at the moment, um, but there are some places where it is. And so that would determine in a particular location who makes those recommendations. Thanks, Katrina. Um, Angie is asking, uh, she's saying there is good evidence and recommendations in regards to bread on IDDSI. Uh, and I think you barely touched on this um, <clears throat> at the beginning when you were talking about bread, but she's asking, what about cakes, muffins, brownies, and pancakes, Peter? Thanks, Alan. Um, Angie, this is a great question. And, and again, I'm, I'm going to reiterate the fact that um, the testing methods that have been recommended would be the best way to determine uh, whether cakes, muffins, brownies, pancakes actually fall into the descriptors of the textural levels that have been described in the ITSI framework. Um, as Katrina said earlier, you know, you could have one site producing an absolutely beautiful, moist, uh, you know, soaked cake uh, that would be most appropriate uh, for a level six and sometimes even a level five minced and moist. Um, and then you might have, um, you know, some commercially available cake uh, or even cakes that have been produced on site um, that may not behave in that same way. So um, I think this goes back to uh, the, the, the question of many clinicians have come back to us and said, you know, we're so used to having had a list of allowed foods and list of not allowed foods, uh, or, you know, these foods are recommended, these foods are not recommended. Um, we realized that when the ITSI framework was developed, um, that this was one of the challenges that was brought forward by uh, various countries that have developed national standards and, and are reporting that these lists are really just uh, to provide some examples. But ultimately, at the end of the day, um, you can have two products that are named the same way, but behave very differently. So ultimately, we circle everyone back to the testing methods and we say test, 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 um, testing at, you know, the sort of completion of, of the production of the product and making sure that we check again when the product is uh, ready to be served to someone um, and some clinicians have even said to us, gee, you know, we use the testing methods on the foods um, midway through a meal or uh, when the person starts to show some uh, difficulty with that particular food and during the assessment process, they may actually apply the testing method to see if the property or the behavior of that food or that drink has actually changed over time during the assessment process. So um, hopefully that, that's helpful to you, Andy, um, and, and to the audience that, 
that's on the call. Thank you, Peter. Um, Jan, you wanted to address the question uh, about rice with uh, level five? Yeah, um, for Julie. Um, yeah, I think um, you're just wondering about how that uh, fits in. So essentially, there um, again, you have to look at it and, and think about, as Peter mentioned, looking at the testing methods because it, it so depends on how, what kind of rice is it, how is it cooked, et cetera. So in, the, um, in our, our uh, sort of guidelines around that, it, um, we don't want it to be too sticky or glutinous. Um, it shouldn't be separated when it's um, into those individual grains. So we don't want it scattering and, and doing that because you know that can cause problems for people who have difficulty controlling it. So what you need to do is actually serve it with some kind of a sauce that um, sort of holds it together so that it would, um, um, number one, not drip through a fork so it's not too runny. Um, so you, that's where you'd use your drip test. And then also to check and make sure it's not a, too sticky of a consistency using your spoon tilt test. So that's, that's sort of the approach you can use. So you definitely, um, rice can fit in that, but again, you have to make sure how it's prepared and that it is in fact um, served in such a way that it will meet the criteria for level five. Wonderful. Um, there was a question that came in from Heather uh, for the easy to chew diet. I understand it to be more of a diet for clients needing a softer diet due to chewing difficulties and not a dysphagia diet. Why then do liquids need to be drained, um, i.e. fruit? Katrina, hand it over sure. to you. Sure. So uh, thank you for this question, Heather. So uh, we have a recently... Um, uh, provided a, an FAQ answer about the definition of mixed consistencies, where we have a fluid portion that flows away from the solid portion of the food. So um, fruit cocktail would be a good example here. Um, and so would things like cereal floating in milk or a soup with um, pieces of vegetable in it. The truth is that um, definitely people with dysphagia have difficulty handling two textures. But people who have chewing difficulties, even if they don't have dysphagia, will also have difficulty handling um, those consistencies because of the challenges that they face while they're trying to chew, they will likely lose control of the liquid portion. So that's why um, that has been uh, written as a, a thing to avoid on the level seven easy to chew um, diet. I also see, and I think it's a related question that Heather um, answer, asked about level four pureed um, foods. And the question was, can a client who does not require a thickened fluid um, have ice cream? Um, so, um, Ice cream is actually classified or expected to be classified as a transitional food, meaning that it changes its consistency in the mouth because it melts. And so the question here is, what consistency does it become when it melts? And so to apply your clinical decision making to decide whether that's something a particular client can uh, receive um, you need to understand their uh, swallowing with different liquid consistencies. So if the ice cream melts quickly to a thin fluid, um, then a person who is able to handle thin fluids should be fine with that uh, level, uh, with that product. Um, if the ice cream, um, so sorry, if the patient though needs thickened liquids, perhaps they need a mildly thick liquid, then that ice cream would be um, something to avoid for that person. Um, so, and one shouldn't assume that ice cream falls into level four pureed consistency, unless it is a specific ice cream that has been designed so that when it melts, it's of a thicker consistency. And again, you should test it to understand it. Okay, hey, um, going back to a question from Melanie, uh, the question was, what is your best recommendation to complete education in a hospital setting? So it's a bit of a change uh, in, in gears here. 
um, for those who did not get a chance to attend our most recent webinar presented by um, Northern Health uh, in, in British Columbia, we would recommend that you take a few moments and, and watch that webinar, which will be available shortly on our YouTube channel. Um, really, the, 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 the two um, people, our speakers, recommended that the education in, in a hospital setting um, be done at, at, at every level. Um, and I think uh, one of the, the, the key things they said was the, uh, the, the pain was in the preparation. So um, they really, really um, did quite uh, an amazing uh, piece of work around their awareness campaign. They used the uh, ITSI uh, posters, the, the print and um, post posters that, that we have on uh, our website. Uh, just to get people curious, um, they uh, used uh, the uh, hospital-wide system or health authority-wide system screensaver uh, just to, again, uh, prepare people that, that ITSI is coming. Uh, they had in-services that were done uh, to all uh, departments and, 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 and wards. Um, they had champions uh, within their uh, health authority uh, that started talking up ITSI everywhere. Um, I think they even uh, hosted, uh, you know, testing uh, parties. They had a very, very robust uh, multi-professional uh, committee that, that helped them to work on, on many things. Um, I think that the, the best thing that we can recommend to uh, everyone, without it sounding too prescriptive, just because every operation is, is so different, is involve as many people as you can um, and, you know, when you have somebody who is enthusiastic, include them in your champions group um, and get them talking about it. Um, but having said all of that, let's just make sure that as people are going out there talking about ITSI, please refer them back to the information on the ITSI website because that's where we house uh, the most current information uh, and the most up-to-date information so that when people are spreading the news about ITSI, uh, that the information that they're sharing is accurate and most up to date. So, thank you. This is Katrina. I'll jump in and ask the next, answer the next question, which comes from Sassy. Um, Sassy works for a producer of beverages in a region where ITSI terminology has not yet been adopted. And the question, um, describes a situation where patients and clinicians are used to um, having a nectar th consistency that actually tests at the higher end of IDC level two. And so the question that is coming in is whether there's a clinical difference between the higher end and the lower end of a particular IDC range. So in this case, between eight milliliters and four milliliters. Um, the concern is that these are actually two different consistencies and uh, so is it safe um, to move to an ITSI 2 level that might include thinner liquids than you've been used to providing for that patient? Um, and, um, and then related to that, the question is, is, is the ITSI classification meant to be used along with a specific centimeter measurement for each patient. So I'll have attempt to answer this. The first thing is to answer the, the second part there, is the ITSI classification meant to be used along with a specific centimeter measurement? So the answer is no. Um, uh, at the moment, what we are uh, suggesting is that people learn to work with the ranges of the ITSI framework as they are currently identified. And to recognize here that ranges have actually always been around. So whether you used the old British system or the old national dysphagia diet in North America, whichever system you've used before, the targets for consistency labels um, actually involved a range. And quite where your particular product fell along that range is something that was rarely um, information that was available to people. And there was a tendency um, to sort of hug the upper border of ranges. It was a, a, a comfort in, in going thicker as a rule. 
Um, and I think that what the ITSI flow test has brought to light is the fact that there are ranges and uh, people have become aware of the smaller differences. At the moment, uh, the research uh, evidence is still limited. Um, and so we're unable to comment about whether um, a level uh, two product that tests sort of closer to four milliliters is as safe as a product that tests at the higher end of that boundary. What we can say is that the emerging evidence shows that thickening liquids, whether that's to level one, to level two, to level three, to level four, um, in group studies is showing to be effective as a way for reducing penetration and aspiration in patients who show uh, swallowing safety problems on thin liquids. So even thickening to slightly thick is coming out in the early research to be effective for many, many patients. So the answer is you have to look at your, your specific patient um, and, and incorporate this into your assessment. We would encourage you to use the IDSI levels for those assessments. So um, if you have a person that's been using a product at the upper end of level two, um, then um, by all means move down and test a, a slightly thick for comparison, a level one, and then form your clinical decisions appropriately. Um, and um, and then with respect to tailoring products to an individual patient, I think it's important to recognize that products do vary um, from day to day, from batch to batch, from temperature to temperature. So um, any, any patient could on a given day display difficulty with a product that they um, that you expect them to not show difficulty on, and that might indicate that something has changed, as Peter suggested. And then in those specific cases, it's the um, flow test allows you um, to thicken a little bit um, to address that particular problem. Uh, so it's really there is the room for customization, but in terms of labeling, um, the ranges are the ranges, and they come out of um, the evaluation of quite a lot of products that was done at the time of the framework development and clustering of those products into ranges that fell out of that exercise. So um, for now, ITC Level 2 is ITC Level 2, and it spans a range. Thanks, Thanks Katrina. Katrina. Yeah. Oh, um, oh. Peter, I'm going uh, to pass to Jan. Um, Christine is asking level six. For level six soft and bite size, do all condiments have to be thickened? For example, ketchup, mustard, salad, dressings. Right. Okay. Uh, thanks. Sorry, I've just lost your question again here, Julie. There we go. Um, okay. So um, I think there's a couple of ways to, to think about that. First of all, um, I think you have to think about um, what level of um, sort of fluid level is a person on so that you know already um, it, you know what can this person tolerate so if they're if they're fine they can manage up to to one then that's something that you would keep in mind the second piece of this I think is what are you using the condiment with if you're actually kind of mixing it is it is it going on to something is it going to create a dual or mixed texture and then that gets back again at what Katrina just described about the dual or mixed texture so I think you have to kind of um, put it in that kind in, in that context and sometimes when you're when you're using a product to say for example moisten something maybe you're um, mixing mixing rice or something like that up or, or doing something along that line um, you, you know it may need to be a certain consistency to achieve the the correct level of moisture content that you need for that particular person so um, I think you know it, it, it's a bit it's not a direct answer it would be a depends answer and I think those would be the factors that you need to be thick, uh, thinking about um, when you're looking at how you're actually using the condiments. Thanks, Jan. Um, I'll go back to a question from Christine. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, from Julie. 
Uh, the question was, at my facility, we are having trouble qualifying foods in level five. Are there specific foods or recipes that you would suggest for our patients that are on this level of diet? Um, so first of all, Julie, unfortunately, there are, um, ITSI doesn't, at this point, house recipes. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> what we have provided are the testing methods in order to be able to determine uh, if the foods actually behave uh, as described uh, for the level five minced and moist texture. Um, and so I think um, the, the best thing we can recommend uh, is once the assessment is done, um, then make sure that uh, the foods that are uh, texture modified and, and, and ready to be served um, apply to the food, the uh, fork pressure test, making sure that the particles are coming through the tines of the fork uh, to check that the particles are four millimeter um, or less for an adult, two millimeters or less for pediatrics, uh, along with the uh, other dimensions of up to eight millimeters for pediatric up to 15 millimeters for uh, the adult um, using a fork drip test uh, just to ensure that the product is cohesive enough uh, and also the spoon tilt test uh, just to make sure that the product is not too adhesive and sticky. Um, and again, you can find um, the information on the ITSI website uh, under the detailed descriptors, consumer handouts, and also on the YouTube channel, uh, there is a video that uh, demonstrates all of this. Um, having said all of that, um, if it is a textural level that is not commonly used in your facility, um, just a reminder to everyone that even though uh, the ITSI framework continuum of eight levels are presented, um, we have always said that not every single textural level uh, or thickness level need to be offered at every uh, facility in operation. So um, I think you will need to make that decision. Uh, your facility will need to make that decision in terms of what it is that you would like to offer in terms of its textural level and thickness level. Um, and um, we would encourage everyone um, to not name uh, something according to an ITSI level if it does not test uh, to be in that uh, level's descriptor or meet that level's testing methods. Um, and this may be a really good time to then also remind everyone uh, about the ITSE uh, audit tools that are available under our resources tab of our website. Um, that's a, a, a good thing to apply in order for you to determine whether or not the, the food will fall into a certain textural level. So hopefully that's helpful. Uh, Julie, thanks for answering that question. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave this with you as well. Uh, on, on our website, on the IDGSI website, uh, on our resources page, we have a little section that addresses the use of the ITSI logo. Um, and in that section, it says that the ITSI logo cannot be used in any electronic or printed materials, website promotion, information, communications, unless authorized by IDGSI to do so. Uh, so Eric is asking if, we, if they'd like to use uh, the, the IDDSI, how can they do that and can they? Hey, thank you, Erica, for asking that question. Um, first of all, we um, have asked people not to use the IDDSI logo because um, we just want to make sure that uh, people recognize the logo and the associated material as official ITSI produced materials. We know that um, you know, in this, uh, what we call a, a pleasant panic throughout the world uh, at the moment, while people are implementing ITSI and adopting ITSI, there are, very, there are lots of materials being produced. Um, and inevitably, uh, because it's associated with ITSI, uh, there are some people who uh, just 
decided to apply the ITZY logo to Linda Tahiro. Um, and um, then it gets misunderstood as this is an official document from ITZY. So we ask people to kindly respect that so that things like the detailed descriptors, the audit sheets, the consumer handouts, um, the uh, cards that we have produced, the uh, testing reference cards, the ITZY posters um, are recognized as official ITZY materials. We also ask um, companies to not use the ITZY logo uh, or the framework on their uh, products because we want to make sure that people um, don't make an assumption or an association that that particular product is actually endorsed by or certified or qualified uh, or you know, specially tested by ITSI. Um, at this point, ITSI does not certify, endorse, qualify, uh, distinguish one product uh, or uh, service as uh, better than another. Um, we don't do any auditing of the products the uh, manufacturers, the companies, the services themselves uh, are monitoring what it is that they're promoting. Um, and again, as we've said in the past, the, the, the best thing that any consumer can do is um, just to go back to the ITSI website uh, as the central source of information. And so um, Erica continues and, and asks the question, uh, do we need sponsorship in order to use the ITSI logo? Um, so the answer really is no, please do not use the ITSI logo uh, anywhere. Um, our uh, platinum and, and silver sponsors um, are recognized uh, with something that looks like an ITSI logo um, because we recognize for being a proud supporter uh, or for being the foundational supporter. Um, and so yes, in the case of um, the platinum sponsors and, and, and silver sponsors uh, and gold sponsors, uh, you may see something that looks like an ITSI logo, um, but we're really recognizing them for their outstanding support of the work that's being done by ITSI. So, Thanks, Peter. Uh, yeah. You know what, Erica, uh, if you need more information, contact us directly. We'd be happy to talk to you. Yeah, you know what? Eric is actually uh, here raising her hand. So I'm going to see if this works and I'm going to allow her to talk and see if she can respond to that comment. So give me one second. Um, hi, Erica, are you there? Uh, yes, do you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Perfect. Um, so if we cannot use the ITSI logo, um, how can we let our operators or our clients know that we actually use it? That you actually use ITSI, is that what you said? Yeah. Okay, Erica, thank you for asking that question. Um, how you can let them know is um, you are always welcome to use uh, the ITSI framework uh, to identify the uh, use of, of ITSI with your uh, point of sale material or educational material, as long as you cite uh, the Creative Commons license that we have included on our website. The other thing that you can use um, is we have made available to everyone and anyone um, the uh, labels that uh, for each of the textural level and thickness level that includes the color triangles as well as the names. Um, and so that's another way that people can identify uh, that you are uh, or you have tested your product uh, and that you are promoting it as an HC level. Great, thank you, thank you, Erica. And if I may add, because I receive this question often, um, the, the the not being able to use the HC logo does not mean that you have to modify the current documents that are on our website. Those are free for the public to use as is, aka please don't modify and don't feel the need to remove that logo from those documents. Those are official IDDSI uh, documents, so you're free. Uh, Alan, I think you dropped out. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> we, uh, 
<laughs> let, let, let's, let's continue here. Uh, Joanna, uh, Joanna asked the question, we have 500 plus residents in long-term care facility. We've begun testing our menu items using the ITSE testing and found that although our foods are relatively soft, currently allowed for mechanical soft diet, they do not pass the fork pressure test. Our concern is this is going to limit variety. Um, cooked plump raisins, for example, shredded lettuce, crushed pineapple. Who's gonna answer that? Do you want me to give it a go, Peter? Sure. Go ahead. Okay. This is Katrina. So, um, Joanna, thank you for that question. Um, I think it um, reflects what we were talking about earlier, that we don't want the um, levels uh, to be prescriptive. So we don't want to say this is allowed, that is allowed. We want the, um, that's more of a clinical decision. So these items that you've listed, cooked plump raisins, shredded lettuce, crushed pineapple, you would have to look at each of those items and test them to know where they fall in the framework. And then the question is whether or not those are suitable for patients uh, in your facility. Um, one of the things to point out here that it is that it's quite common when a facility starts mapping its current food items to the framework that they discover they have gaps across the framework. Um, and in particular, I think that um, the availability of minced and moist food items has been found to commonly be a gap so that there might be relatively few foods um, available on the menu and just an opportunity for recipe development. Um, the other thing I just want to communicate is that um, uh, that was really a sort of awakening for me myself when I was um, learning to work with the framework is the concept that a particular patient will receive um, recommendation for their food texture level and their liquid texture level and that those two levels span a range of consistencies. So for example, somebody on a level six who can, who can receive level six soft and bite-sized foods and um, needs level two mildly thick liquids um, should uh, in principle also be able to tolerate the levels that fall in between those two boundaries so that you could compose the diet um, plan for that patient to include items that fall anywhere between levels two and level six, and that that allows for um, perhaps some more variety. Um, it, I think um, as a speech pathologist, this was a surprise to me to, to sort of come to realize that a given tray for a given patient isn't all uniformly in one level. Um, but And this recognition that what we're talking about are boundaries that you shouldn't go beyond um, may be helpful to think about. Thanks, so. Katrina. Yeah. Um, Meredith asked a question about how are auditors being educated on ITSE? Uh, one concern that uh, they're hearing is that auditors can use guidelines as written meaning that some foods mentioned in the food texture restrictions section may be considered restricted by an auditor, even if a facility prepares and tests these foods and find that they meet the testing guidelines. How do you suggest the facilities write up their protocols so they don't get cited? Um, great question, Meredith. We are um, trying to uh, educate the auditors just as much as we're trying to educate, uh, you know, clinicians and food services and, and, and everyone else. Um, one of the things that um, we have learned uh, from one of the uh, Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, uh, it's a task force member who is a state auditor, um, is that um, at this point, um, the information or the position going through uh, the state auditors uh, group is that as uh, the United States is transitioning or uh, implementing ITSE, uh, the, the best thing you can do is, is clearly identify what system are you currently following. Um, 
and identify that to the auditor. And so that the auditor would then be auditing according to the system that you are currently using. <clears throat> One of the biggest concerns when ITSI was introduced uh, was that you know, all auditors, um, wherever you are in the world, would uh, jump into a, a facility and immediately audit according to ITSI. And so I think what we're recommending to people is be very clear what guidelines or what system you are using uh, and make sure that that is mentioned to the auditor. And the next best thing that you can do is actually demonstrate to the auditors um, that you have completed the testing and that um, what is prepared meets the ITC uh, testing guidelines. Um, the audit tools, the audit sheets are good records to be able to use uh, to demonstrate to the auditors that you have a testing uh, system in place and that this is how you're ensuring that what you're preparing actually meets uh, what uh, system that, that, that you're using. So hopefully that, that's uh, helpful to you, Meredith. Um, the, Meredith also asked a question about why does the easy to chew diet place restrictions on items that have excess liquid? Um, Katrina, I think you answered that one before, um, yes. but feel free to jump in if there's further information here. I don't think so. I think it's just that uh, people who have chewing difficulties are likely to um, have difficulty um, managing fluid while they're working on, on, um, on chewing. Uh, so it's a caution um, about excess liquid. Hey, um, Peter, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead and, and read one to you because I think it's an important one. Uh, Allison says she works in the northeast of England and that they've been using the ITSI recommended syringes during all of their implementation and training. Um, they still need to continue to flow test liquids, um, but they're unable currently to order the appropriate syringes because they uh, are no longer available in the UK. And um, can you advise how to go forward? Great, thanks. Um, Alison, we, we recognize that challenge um, throughout Europe. And in, in fact, um, the syringe that was previously recommended, we know has been discontinued. Um, one of the things that um, we are encouraging everybody to do at the moment. Um, what ITSI did was we tried to secure every available uh, remaining syringe uh, in the European community. Um, and those have uh, been distributed among the uh, industry partners uh, that supply thickeners. So um, I think, Alison, the first thing I would suggest you do is, if you can, contact um, the thickener company uh, or the nutritional company that uh, you use to see if they can supply you with any more uh, of the remaining syringes. And having said that, um, we are working on a possible solution. And so uh, this is probably the first time that we're showing this uh, to the world um, is that ITSI is, is working, if you look at your screen, uh, for those who can see your screen, on a prototype flow test funnel um, where um, you actually uh, would use this uh, to do the flow testing without the need for the plunger. We're trying to be uh, friendly to the environment. And so in fact, uh, the, the top of the funnel, as you can see on the screen, is where you would pour in your thickened liquid uh, you would run the flow test just as you do now with the same uh, procedure. And we have uh, actually made markings on these so that you can easily identify what level um, the uh, thickened liquid would fall into. Please know that this is um, a prototype concept at the moment. Uh, we are working on producing uh, these and trying to get them out to communities where the uh, syringes are no longer available to um, people and so primarily in the European community to start um, and that these uh, when they get out there will be for beta testing purposes um, and if they're successful then we'd like to make them available to the global audience um, and so 
Allison, um, hopefully you're happy to hear that answer. Be patient with us. Uh, we're trying our best uh, to get these out there as soon as possible so that people can continue flow testing. We know how important it is to have um, the right uh, you know, dimension to uh, the flow test funnel. And so um, there you go. We uh, Please stand by. We're, we're going to try our best to, to get this out to you ASAP. Um, at this point, I think I'll go back to a question from um, Michelle. And the question was, in many facilities, a mixed diet is recommended. Um, for example, all meats are minced and moist, but the sides are presented at soft and bite size. Is there a way to use ITC to make a diet recommendation for this? Uh, Katrina, I'll hand it to you. Sure. Thank you for this question, Michelle. So I think this speaks to a concept I was um, talking about earlier that a patient um, may be able to tolerate a range of levels on the framework. Um, but here you're talking about a situation where there might be a particular item um, that is more challenging and you've, you've said meat. Uh, so I think here that um, if the tests suggest uh, that the patient uh, can generally handle items that are soft and bite-sized, but meat is an exception, then this is a place where in terms of writing a diet order, um, you would, uh, would find a, a way in your facility to make an exception. Um, and here the exception is, is on the more restrictive, in the more restrictive direction, so that their um, they're, uh, food texture recommendation would be level six, soft and bite-sized, except for meat. Um, and there, and then uh, there would be um, a modification of the meat for that person. Um, I think it's always better if the modification, the exception is in the more restrictive direction than the other. Um, but um, there probably are circumstances when it could go either way. Hey. <clears throat> Thanks, Katrina. Um, there's a question um, from, oh goodness, we lost it here. Um, from Melanie asking, how do you recommend problem solving thickening with infant cereal for infants unable to utilize artificial thickeners? We're finding that varying formulas based on, uh, based upon caloric content, et cetera, require different recipes with limitations on the kinds, brands of infant cereal that will allow flow testing. Jan, we'll hand that one to you if you don't mind. I think she might have had to leave. Oh. Yeah, she, she okay. wasn't able to stay to the top of the hour. Um, okay. We'll note that question and hopefully be able to get an answer out uh, in the e-bite. So Melanie, please stay tuned. Um, the, um, the clock is showing two minutes to the top of the hour. Uh, we'll do our best to handle uh, a, a couple more questions. Um, so um, for the questions that do not get answered, we'll uh, do our best to incorporate some answers then in our upcoming e-bite. Um, so uh, there's a question here um, about <clears throat> how does an organization, um, oh, our questions are jumping around here, pardon us. How does an organization handle foods for manufacturers such as pre-molded pureed items that claim to be level four uh, pureed but do not pass the testing method? So I'll be happy to answer that one. Um, the, the, the best answer we can give you is go back to the manufacturer. Um, we know that recently there have been a lot of manufacturers um, sticking labels onto their products uh, without having re formulated or tested their products. Um, we do receive a lot of these communications from uh, ITSE users worldwide. Um, because everyone has the ability to be able to test the products now, um, we challenge everyone to just go back to the manufacturers and say, hey, look, we tested your product. It certainly doesn't behave in the way that's been described. Um, can you explain or can you do something about it? Um, again, the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the use of, of ITSE um, is, is, is meant for all of us. Um, and, you know, 
again, no uh, offense to manufacturers who are on the call. Um, if you are going to label a product according to an ITSE level, um, you know, please make sure that it's been tested thoroughly um, and that uh, you have the ability to explain to the users why the products would behave in a certain way. Um, we'll take one last question um, so that uh, we respect the, the, the time that we said would be available for this time town hall. Um, and, and this question says, uh, since everything really comes down to testing, um, would you say that items must be tested every time an item is produced? For example, pureed meatloaf is produced four times a month. Do you suggest that this is tested every time to ensure it is compliant with level four? My clients are concerned that due to them being short staff and lack of time, they won't have time to test all levels for all menus. Any advice? Um, Katrina, do you want to... <laughs> I'm not the food service person, but I'll give it a shot. Um, so Emily, I think that um, as a rule, the mapping exercise, provided you have standard recipes, should give you a sense of where a product is expected to fall. And then if you're in a sort of production environment, um, it's uh, you could develop a schedule for how often you want to check certain things and then um, and monitor it. Um, I think that um, four times a month for a particular item uh, probably should be feasible. Um, but I guess perhaps a different way to think about it would be um, that every day a test is being run on one item um, or a couple of items just to manage the load and make it a regular quality assurance mechanism. Um, I know in our hospital there's um, um, a thickened uh, beverage that's produced in house and um, there's a test run uh, regularly um, at, to just pull one cup of that product and, and run it through a syringe, um, a flow test. Um, so I think it just comes down to planning the, the, the testing um, agenda. Peter. Thanks, Katrina. Yeah, sorry, sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, you know, from a food service audit perspective, I think, again, we would say um, as an organization, as a food service operation, <clears throat> you'll need to decide how often you feel the testing needs to be done. For some sites, we've been told uh, they've incorporated the testing of products uh, randomly, like they have done with um, temperature audits. Um, and <clears throat> again, the frequency where you do these audits <clears throat> will really be um, up to you um, as long as you feel confident that the product you produce um, is actually meeting the it's the testing methods. So we hope that, um, you know, that message of, of testing, testing, testing um, will be something that people will um, embrace. Um, the fact that uh, there are standardized recipes, as um, Katrina said, does not always um, give you the outcome you're looking for. Um, <clears throat> the oven may be operating, you know, at a higher temperature. Uh, the, the, the steamer uh, may be, you know, uh, producing, you know, less moisture. Um, the holding of the food will change um, the, uh, depending on the time of the year, the starch content of uh, various foods may impact the way uh, the food uh, changes over time. So we, we really do hope that that message gets through um, and that the reason why uh, ITSI emphasizes the, the, the testing methods that are used. Um, and so looking at the clock, it's four minutes past the top of the hour. Um, we would like to, at this point, just pause the, the town hall um, and say thank you to everyone uh, that has come on today to ask the questions. Uh, if your questions did not get answered today, again, uh, we'll take note of it and we'll do our best to uh, try to address it in upcoming e-bytes. Um, we have another town hall session on the 
1st of October. Uh, for those who celebrate Halloween, well, uh, come and uh, celebrate Halloween with us um, on the Itzy Town Hall on October 31st. Um, the session will be hosted at uh, 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time um, and 4 p.m. Pacific Time. And so uh, come and join us again. Uh, we do see lots of comments about uh, trying to host these more often. Uh, yes, we will try to do that. And uh, thank you for all those who have taken the time to attend today. Uh, as Alan said earlier, the recording of this particular uh, town hall will be available at the end of the month uh, on the ITC website. And so we look forward to chatting with people again. We wish you all a very good day. Uh, and thank you to Katrina Steele and Jan Dubestein uh, for being part of the panels uh, panelists today. So wishing everybody a great day. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>